story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Two million people, almost a million kids. The people have tried to plan for them. They've built schools for them to learn in. Beaches and parks for them to play in. Most of the kids follow the course as planned. A few of them get lost on the way. When they do, it makes trouble for me. I'm a cop. It was Thursday, April 10th. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name's Friday. A crime wave had suddenly erupted among the teenagers of the city. We were getting reports of robberies, burglaries, and bodily assault. We didn't know why it was happening, but we had to try and stop it. We had trouble Monday night. Yeah, sounds like it might be the same gang, too. This kid is sure moving fast. Yeah, did you leave the note for Simmons? Mm-hmm. All set. What is it this time? Movie theater on West Fremont, small neighborhood house. Mm-hmm. They had a crowd of 15 or 20 kids in there today, mixed group, boys and girls. For no reason at all, they started to tear the place up. They do much damage? Well, we can see when we get there. They told me on the phone, theater manager tried to quiet the kids down. Half a dozen boys piled all over him. One of them pulled a knife. They tore up a couple of seats, moved out into the lobby, smashed mirrors, lamps, beat up one of the ushers. The lousy little punks would give a right arm to know how this thing got started. We never had much trouble from the kids in that neighborhood out there, Joe. Not until this last month. They seem to be going crazy. Well, it's not getting any better. Burglaries, car thefts, wrecking property. Somebody's going to come out on the short end if it keeps up. It's got to happen. Well, maybe it already has, Frank. When they were ripping up that theater lobby today, one kid got hurt. What happened? Fourteen-year-old boy. In the mix-up, he got shoved through a display case, plate glass. Cut up pretty bad. Well, his eyes. I'm not sure he's going to see again. In police work, the standard law of cause and effect works like it does for everything else. When a crime's committed, there's a cause behind it. There's a reason for it. And when a group of normally well-behaved kids in an average residential neighborhood start running wild, there's got to be a reason for that, too. A month before, a rash of auto thefts, petty stealing, and public disturbances had broken out suddenly in this particular neighborhood. All of the incidents were traced directly to the teenagers in the area. Why the kids had suddenly decided to run wild, we didn't know. But the amount and nature of the violations kept getting more serious. Juveniles who'd previously been picked up for petty thefts and placed on probation were now being brought in on charges of burglary. Auto thefts in the area had jumped 20%. Misconduct and drunk charges against the teenagers, girls and boys alike, increased by the week. We had a fair idea what the root of all the trouble was. So far, we hadn't been able to trace it. 3.07 p.m. We got to the neighborhood movie theater on West Fremont. We went inside. The lobby was a shambles. A new show had just started. The manager of the theater met us in the lobby, a Mr. Clyde Barton. At the best of me, Sergeant, I don't know what to make of it. Just look at that wreck. You'd think they were a bunch of savages. You have any idea at all what started them off, Mr. Barton? No, no idea in the world. A bunch of them came in about 2 o'clock today. Boys and girls both. They sat in front and watched the picture for a while. And it started to get noisy. Did you recognize the kids? I mean, are they from the neighborhood here? Sure, I know who they are. It, I say they started to make trouble down in front, kicking the back of the seats and yelling around. Usher couldn't do anything with them, so I went down to tell them to quiet down or get out. Well, did any of them in particular seem responsible for the racket? Any ringleader? Mm, not that I noticed, no. I tried to be nice to kids, reason with them. They just wouldn't have it. Must have been almost two dozen of them. When they wouldn't behave, I told them to leave. I'd give them their money back. What'd they do? Mm, got real foul mouth. One or two of the girls, too. Some of the language I wouldn't even use at a stag party. Well, I got so mad, I grabbed two of the guys by the neck and told them to get out. And that's when it broke loose. What happened exactly? A whole crowd of them jumped out of their seats and piled on me. I fell back down there on the floor and I started swinging. Tell you the truth, Sergeant, I, I was scared. I didn't know what to make of them. It seemed like a pack of animals, wild. I happened to hit this one kid and I saw him pull out a knife and come at me. You usually get along pretty well with the neighborhood kids, do you, Mr. Barton? They don't have any grudge against you that you know of? Not that I know of, no. Up until a few weeks ago, everything was fine. I never had a bit of trouble with them. Then all this rowdy stuff began. I tell you, it's got the best of me. This is the first time you've had any trouble of any real size, is that right? Yeah, well, 
Once in a while, the kids fool around in the show, talking loud, you know, but nothing like this. <laughs> you want to see Fred, my usher, the way they messed him up. Brutal. That little 14-year-old that they shoved through the glass showcase. Gonna be a real mess if he doesn't pull through. I was gonna ask you, sir, about the kids in that crowd you recognized. You happen to know any of their names? Here's the list. Seven names in all. Every one of those kids was in that gang. I can give you a hand tracking down their addresses. Thank you. Something else. Here. Here's what I was talking about. What's this, sir? In that scramble here in the lobby, that little box fell out of one of the kids' pockets. One of the ushers picked it up and brought it into me. Have a look inside. Frank? Uh-huh. I don't know too much about it, Sergeant, but I got a hunch. I don't think I made a mistake. Yeah. What do you think? No, sir, it's no mistake. Marijuana. We finished interviewing the theater manager, Clyde Barton, and then we talked to the usher, Donald Masters, who recovered the small box containing the marijuana from the floor of the lobby. He told us he recognized the young fellow who dropped the box. He said the boy's name was Harold Everson, one of the names which appeared on the list which the theater manager, Mr. Barton, had given us. 7.45 p.m., Frank and I located the Everson boy's home. It was a two-story frame, colonial-style house in a better-than-average section of the city. The boy's father answered the door, a Harold Everson senior. We told him what we wanted. We were about to sit down and eat. You have to make routine calls at dinner time? Not a routine call, Mr. Everson. We'd like to see your son if he's home. Harry, what do you have to see him about? Do you have any idea where your boy spent his time today after school? Well, he said he was going down to the gym to play a little basketball. Then he was going to the library. School night. He had studying to do. I think maybe you ought to keep a closer check on your son, sir. That's not the way we get it. Well, what are you getting at? I trust my boy. He said he was going to the gym and then to the library. Got no reason to lie about it. We had a minor riot at a neighborhood movie down in West Fremont today, sir. A gang of high school kids ran wild and wrecked the place. What's that got to do with Harry? Well, a couple of people recognized him among the gang of kids. They say he did his share of wrecking along with the rest of them. Well, it couldn't be. It's a lie. Harry didn't go to the show today. He told me when he got home, he even had his books with him. He spent the afternoon at the library. I'd like to have you take a look at this, Mr. Everson. Hmm? This box here, would you recognize that at all? Well, yeah. Same kind of box my stomach pills come in. Got a little acid condition in my stomach. I take these pills for it. What's all this have to do with Harry? Open the box, Mr. Everson. I don't get it. What is this stuff? Someone saw your son drop the box in the lobby of that theater today. The box contains what appears to be marijuana. Well, that's stupid. It couldn't be right. I haven't got that kind of boy. I know it isn't right. Do you mind if we talk to your son? Maybe he can explain it for us. Just a minute. I'll get him down here. Have a chair if you like. Thank you. It's sure a nice place, huh, Joe? Yeah, beautiful furniture, isn't it? Nothing like period furniture. Never goes out of date. Be in style ten years from today. Mm -hmm. We better be sure and tag by Georgia Street Hospital on the way back, see how that kid's doing, the one that was hurt at the show. Oh, yeah. Officers, this is my son, Harry. Hello, Harry. Hello. Hi, right, Harry. Harry just told me, officers, he doesn't know what this is all about. He was at the library, like I said. Well, sure. I was there till they closed. Somebody made a mistake. I wasn't at the show today. You know Mr. Barton, Harry, the man who runs the theater? Yeah, I know him. Why? He swears you were there today, so does one of the ushers. Who? Hmm. Why, the name of Donald Masters, he says he knows you pretty well. I don't know any Donald Masters. We go to the same high school together, son. You're in the same class. I told you, I don't know any Donald Masters. What about this, Harry? Huh? Would you recognize this? No. What is it, Harry? What's wrong with you? Nothing. I, I don't know whose it is. It's not mine. Well, it was lost in the lobby of the theater today. Masters says he saw you drop it. He's lying. I hate the kid's guts anyway. He's lying. I thought you said you didn't know him, son. What are you shaking for? What kind of story are you trying to tell? I didn't mean it, Dad. A kid got this stuff for me. I didn't mean to get it. I didn't mean to, Dad. It's beginning to look like I'm the dunce of the family, huh? Take it easy, Mr. Everson. You liar, Harry. A kid got this stuff for me, Dad. It's the truth. I didn't buy it. You want him downtown, officers? Right, so, Mr. Everson. I'd like to have you come with him. Go get dressed. Go back to your room and get your clothes on. Okay, Dad. I can't believe it. My own boy using marijuana. Can't tell you how I feel. Afraid there's going to be more folks feeling the same way before this is all cleaned up. But it'd be different if Harry didn't have a chance. A good home, good training. Boys had the best I could give him. Yes, sir. It's the last thing in the world I thought could happen. I never even thought about it. I never entered my mind. Yes, sir. Same for my wife. We never even worried about it. Neither one of us. Maybe that's why it happened.
Before we left the Everson house, we checked the boy's room and came up with another small box full of marijuana, which he'd hidden back in his closet. Besides Everson and his son, Harry, four other teenagers who'd had a part in the theater brawl were rounded up and taken downtown along with their fathers for interrogation. By the time we finished our questioning and the teenagers had finished talking, we had most of the story pieced together. A story that had the parents so amazed that half of them thought the youngsters were making it up. The pattern was familiar enough for us to know that they were telling the truth. Almost two months before, word had gone around among the teenagers in the neighborhood that marijuana, along with various stimulating drugs, was to be had easily and in quantity for anybody who wanted them. Word was passed around that it was the new thing to do, the smart thing to do, if you wanted to keep up with the crowd. In questioning the Everson boy, we found that he seemed to know more about the history and operations of the narcotics campaign in the neighborhood than the other boys did. I know one of the guys who first showed up with this stuff. His name's Johnny Demering. He's about my age, 17. I used to know him pretty well. How do you mean he was the first to show up with this stuff, Harry? What kind of stuff? Marijuana and some of the other things. You know, yellow jackets, goofballs. More of the kids go for them than they do for marijuana. And do the youngsters know what these goofballs are made of, son? Do they know what they are? It's dope, I guess. Narcotics. Kids get a big kick out of them. I guess that's all they care. Well, now, this Johnny Demering, does he sell the stuff around the neighborhood, Harry? Well, yeah, he was the first one. He's got a couple other kids selling for him now. A couple of them are girls. They sell a lot for him. Johnny makes pretty good money. Yeah, I guess he does. Where does he get the stuff from, do you know? No, I wouldn't know that. Some place downtown, Johnny knows a guy. Never told anybody where he goes to meet the guy. Nobody ever goes with him. Was Johnny at the show with you today? Well, no, he doesn't hang around with the kids much anymore. He's getting a little big time, I think. Got his own car, good-looking girlfriend downtown. Says he's gonna quit school next month. Where does Johnny live, son? Can you tell us that? I don't know the address right off. I can check it for you in the phone book. How about the kids that Johnny hires to sell the stuff? Can you give us their names? Yeah, okay. I, I think I can remember who they are. You gonna bring Johnny in and talk to him? That's the idea, yeah, son. I don't know if you'll find him right away. He probably heard about the trouble today. Johnny's a pretty smart guy. We'll find him. Nobody knows much about him. He never talks about what he's doing. Never tells anybody anything. Well, he told you. How smart was that? Complete statements were taken from each of the youngsters we'd brought in for questioning, and then in practically all cases, they were detained pending the completion of the investigation. With the information we had at hand, it took us the better part of four days to round up everybody involved in the narcotics distribution system, which had been set up among the teenagers in the neighborhood by 17-year-old Johnny Demering. As for the Demering boy himself, he couldn't be found. We checked with his family, his relatives, his friends, all his known associates. We got out a want on him. And then we checked the car he owned through DMV and we got out a want for that. No sign of the boy. Narcotics division gave us a hand and got their informants busy trying to track down the source of the dope for which the Demering boy had been the only distributor. We knew it went far beyond him. The whole campaign to introduce narcotics in a seemingly harmless form among neighborhood teenagers and then gradually build a solid demand for more expensive stuff as the habit grew and took roots with each and every youngster. It reached to the same vicious men who make their money off the hopeless adult drug addict. The same vicious men who today are trying to build a new market for their wares among the young people of this country. Tuesday, April 29th, 2.30 p.m. I'll get it. Right. Juvenile Division, Smith. Yeah, Brady. Uh-huh. Is that right? What's his name? All right. Right, goodbye. Joe. Yeah. Brady from Narcotics, the figure they got our man. The Deming boy? No, the guy was pushing the stuff to Deming. His name's Jack O'Harris. They found him in the county hospital this morning. Yeah. Somebody got a hold of him two nights ago, gave him a good working over. If we're lucky, we'll make it. What do you mean? He's not supposed to last the day. 2.35 p.m. Frank and I left the office and went immediately to the county hospital where we were allowed to interview the narcotic suspect, Jack O'Harris, briefly. He was in critical condition with a fracture of the skull. He gave us a statement in the form of a dying declaration. He admitted being the connection for 17-year-old Johnny Demering and admitted also that he kept the boy supplied with enough narcotics to keep the neighborhood teenage demand for the stuff fully satisfied. You seem like a good boy, Johnny. Nice kid. Smart. I never thought he'd turn away, did that all. Where is he, Jocko? Do you know? I only wish I did. Go beat his head in, get my stuff back. Took everything I had. One of the biggest hauls I ever handled. Every ounce. What was it, heroin? The best. Got only one word for you. Yeah. You better get him fast. 
He's got enough H to start a war. Wednesday, April 30th, 9 a.m., the hunt for 17-year-old Johnny Demering was intensified. To our knowledge, because of the information we'd gained from narcotics peddler Jocko Harris, the teenage youngster had a large store of high-grade heroin, which we knew, because of his inexperience, he was unaccustomed to dealing with. In his hands, the narcotics immediately became a lethal weapon. We knew that Johnny Demering had only one market to deal in, only one type of customer he was acquainted with, the teenager. In previous transactions, we knew the youngsters received only a low-grade type of narcotic, highly diluted. We knew that if Demering succeeded in dispensing the highly concentrated store he had on hand and the juvenile customers he served tried it on themselves, it would very likely result in death. 11 a.m. Wednesday. Despite all our efforts, Johnny Demering and the store of high-grade narcotics which he'd hijacked from Jocko Harris were still missing. Wednesday, 12 noon, we began rechecking every one of the possible sources that might lead us to the suspect. One of them was the boy's mother, a Mrs. Frances Demering. We talked to her at her work. She was employed as a motograph operator in the mailing department of a large downtown department store. Not since the last time you talked to me, officer. I haven't heard a word from my boy, nothing at all. Have you heard anything? Well, yes, ma'am, in a way. We've got an ID still somewhere in the city. That's why we figured we'd come back and talk to you again. Have you been in touch with your relatives in town recently, Ms. Demering? I mean, those Johnny might possibly contact. Yes, there's just my sister and my mother. They're the only ones I think Johnny'd go to in a case like this. Maybe because he's in trouble and all. I only wish I could have stopped the whole thing. I mean, even before it started. It should never have even started. Yes, ma'am. I guess it just wasn't to be right from the start. Johnny's father ran away, you know. I tried my best after that. It never seemed to be enough. I suppose there's no getting away from it. A boy needs a father. You can try all you want. They still need a father. Some kind of discipline. Yes, ma'am. Well, how about the relatives you have out of town, Ms. Demering? Any word from them at all about Johnny? No, Sergeant, nothing. Matter of fact, I've been waiting for a letter. Nothing at all. Do you have any idea at all where Johnny most likely go in town if he didn't want to be seen, Mrs. Demering? Where he'd go? No, I wouldn't know that, Sergeant. First place, Johnny's never really been in trouble before. I mean, where he'd have to hide. He's always been good to me. Maybe too good. I wouldn't know that. Well, how about Johnny's school friends, ma'am? Would there be any one of them he might possibly contact in a jam? None that I haven't told you about before, I don't think. Evelyn, she's the only one I suppose Johnny'd go to if he needed help, if he was in trouble. That's his girlfriend at the high school, Evelyn Maxford. Yes, that's right. Sweet girl. How about a girlfriend that Johnny was supposed to have downtown somewhere, Miss Demling? Would you know anything about her? Nothing really, no. I knew Johnny had some other girl besides Evelyn. He did mention she lived downtown. I guess that's all I know about her. Her name was Betty, I think. Johnny mentioned it once. That's all I know about her, though. You have no idea where she lived downtown? No, I don't. Johnny and his girlfriends, that was one thing I tried not to pry into. All right, ma'am. Thank you very much. Appreciate it if you'd notify us if you hear anything at all about your son. All right, thank you. Tomorrow's Johnny's birthday, you know, I meant to tell you. I always expect Johnny home on his birthday. Seems no matter where he is, how he's tied up with his school or sports or something, Johnny always makes it home for his birthday. I see. I wonder how it'll be tomorrow. He's never missed being home on his birthday, not once. Well, if he shows up, I guess you can count on one thing, ma'am. What's that? You might have to miss next year. 2 p.m., Frank and I picked up a glass of milk and a hot dog for lunch, and then we continued making a check of Johnny Demering's closest friends. Next in line after his mother was Demering's high school girlfriend, Evelyn Maxford. We located her at home. She seemed unusually nervous as we interviewed her. No, there's nothing wrong. It's just all this business about Johnny, all this trouble. I've been upset ever since I heard about it. You haven't heard from Johnny at all, Miss Maxford. He's made no attempt to contact you since the last time we talked. I haven't heard a word, officer. I know tomorrow's his birthday. His mother's expecting him home. I know he won't come, though. I'm sure of that. How are you sure, miss? Well, I just know that's all. I guess he should give himself up and take his chances. But I know he won't. I know Johnny that well. He just isn't that type. I'd like to ask you again, miss. Yes? Are you sure you haven't heard from Johnny Demering recently in the past two days or so? No. That's what I told you. Don't you believe me? Do you know why we're so anxious to locate Johnny, Miss Maxford? Oh, I think so. It's about the narcotics business. You say Johnny had a hand in it. 
He was selling those things to the kids. I still don't believe it myself. It's a lot more than that, the way it stands now, Miss Maxford. What do you mean? When he was at school, Johnny was kept supplied with narcotics by a man named Jocko Harris. He's what we call a pusher, a kind of an in-between supply man in the narcotics trade. Uh -huh. Two nights ago, Johnny caught up with Harris. He beat him up badly enough to send him to the hospital with a skull fracture. And then Johnny stole every bit of narcotics Harris had in his room, some of the strongest stuff he can buy on the market. That's why we want Johnny, Miss Maxford. I don't think I understand. What does it mean? Well, it means that most of the teenage kids Johnny's been supplying stuff to have been getting fairly weak grades of heroin. If he gets some of this stuff to them and the kids start taking it, it might prove too strong for them. If they take too much of it, it could kill them outright. Oh, no. Now you see what we're up against. We've got to find that boy, and we've got to find him soon. Couldn't you talk to his mother? Maybe she could tell you something. We already have, miss. She couldn't tell us anything. That's why we halfway depended on you. Why do they have to put it in my lap? Why does it have to be me? I liked Johnny for a while. I don't know what to think now. Have you heard from him, Miss Maxford? There's no reason to be afraid. You'd probably feel a lot worse if something happened to one of the high school kids, wouldn't you? Miss Maxford? I got a call from him yesterday. Johnny. He wouldn't tell me where he was. I asked him, but he wouldn't tell me. Well, what else did he say? He knows everybody's looking for him. He doesn't know about the stuff that he stole, though. I'm sure of that. He doesn't know what it could do. Did he make any dates with you? Did he want to see you? Yes, he wants to see me. He wants me to meet him this evening. Where? He's going to tell me. Excuse me, I'll have to get the phone. Hello? Yes? Oh, but I don't know. I don't, really. What? 5.30? All right. Yes. Yes, I'll meet you then. All right. Bye. Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. That was Johnny just then. He wanted to make sure I was going to meet him. When? 5.30 in Lake Park. Which side, miss? The west side. Sergeant, I could hardly understand him. He said he was sick. Ma'am? He sounded sick, too. Terribly sick. It can't be true. I hope to God it's not true. What's that? The narcotics he stole from that man. You say they were powerful? Yes, ma'am, we did. Johnny's been taking them for two days. Together with two other men from Juvenile Bureau, Hearst and McTie, we drove down near the appointed spot along the lake in Lake Park, where Evelyn Maxford's meeting with the teenage suspect Johnny Demering was to take place. We staked out at a reasonable distance, and Miss Maxford went ahead to the meeting spot. As far as we could see, there was no sign of Demering. Someone on the opposite side of the lake was playing a phonograph. The music came over faintly across the water. We watched the Maxford girl make her way up the path into the park. as we could get there. When we got close enough, we found out the reason for the scream. He was lying face up in the water near a clump of trees. He was a good-looking boy, dark hair, good build, handsome. Took only one look and you knew right away he was too young to be dead. You could argue for a week, but you couldn't change it. He was dead. The girl stood over him, her face in her hands, crying. I don't see any marks in the body, do you, Joe? No. Looks like an overdose, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Better get her out of here, huh? Yeah. It's all right, Miss Maxford. Come on. Let's go over here. We'll have one of the other officers take you home. We can take care of what has to be done here. He was a good boy, Sergeant. He was smart. How could he ever get started in such a thing? How could he make such a mistake? He had the best excuse in the world, miss. Yes? He was 17. On May 2nd, a coroner's inquest was held at the county morgue, Hall of Justice, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest.
Those involved in the juvenile narcotics ring, a total of eight persons were tried and convicted under the State Narcotics Act. They receive sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Uh -huh.